The Secrets of Doctor Who is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous supporters. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash donate. You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, episode 129. One day, I shall come back. And that's it. I've been renewed. As when a time lord's body wears out, he regenerates. I'm a time lord. I'm not a human being. I walk in eternity. Brave heart, Change, my dear. It seems on a moment too soon. Unlimited vice pudding! Position first. Wearing a bit thin. Fantastic. I am Scottish. About things. Ooh. Be fine. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about this hit BBC series, Doctor Who, of course. And today we're discussing the 2007 Christmas special, Voyage of the Damned, plus a mini episode that aired before it called Time Crash. Today, uh, I'm joined by, on the panel by Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going, Dom? Very well. And Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Uh, before we get started, folks, please write an iTunes review if you can. Uh, it is so important to us uh, to have those reviews. We appreciate so much those of you who have written them. And if you have not been able to yet, please go into app, the Apple Podcast or iTunes app and write a review for the show. That is the number one way that gets us new viewers uh, through the iTunes directory because iTunes uses reviews and the number of reviews and the and the number of stars in the review as a algorithm for who to show this to. So when someone's looking for something about Doctor Who, they'll get this podcast. So we really do appreciate. It. It's not we don't we're not just looking for you to stroke our ego. That's nice. That's a nice uh, perk of it. But we really like is just to be able to get that algorithm boost so we can get more people to find out about the show uh, altogether. So we really do appreciate that. So let's talk about the this episode. So we've just finished. So it was June of 2007. We had Last of the Time Lords, the the ultimate, the final episode for Martha Jones, apart from a future guest appearances. Uh, but her first, last time as a full-time companion, the master, that whole uh, thing, and the end of that third season, that was June. And then in November, for the Children in Need BBC special, uh, mm-hmm. there is this little, what was it, eight, ten minute little uh, yeah, video? Yeah, something like that. Yeah, uh, called Time Crash, which was a little treat for the Doctor Who fans. And it takes place in that time span. In the, it's, uh, it's in the final moments of yeah. the of Last of the Time Lords. Martha has just self actualized over. You know her character <laughs> arc is now at its completion, right? And so she leaves the Doctor. And the next thing we see in that episode is the Titanic crashing into the TARDIS. Um, and this episode occurs between those two events, between Martha right. leaving and the Titanic crashing in, right? Uh, this was written by Stephen Moffat, uh, incidentally, this this little bit. And who, features, who, was, who was not showrunner yet. Yes, he had written, uh, he's, he'd been a uh, scriptwriter on several of the most popular episodes so far, but not uh, not showrunner. And it uh, it features the 10th Doctor, David Tennant, but also coming back to reprise his role, the 5th Doctor, uh, Peter Davison. And wow, this was a lot of fun, guys. <laughs> yeah, say. it was. It was it's a 10 meets five. Now five is 10's mother-in-law, uh, father-in-law, but became, not yet at this point. Right. Became <laughs> that. It's very wibbly wobbly timey wimey. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Cause 10 is married to his daughter. Who's really five's daughter. <laughs> yeah. Who's also the doctor's daughter of the 10th doctor. <laughs> right. So, yeah. And so, now has her own big finish series. Yes. So yes. Uh, we, and we'll obviously be getting to that. Actually, I think in this very season, uh, we'll be getting to that episode with uh, mm-hmm. the doctor's daughter. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, ten, it's it's so fun to see like Tenet get all excited um, as, as he meets Peter Davison because because he actually calls him "You're my doctor" in yeah. in, in this. That's breaking uh, the fourth wall. Because yeah. kind of kind of sort of. I, I'd seen one report that it, this was David Tennant's line. I'd seen another report though that this was Stephen Moffat's line. Yeah. Uh, but this is actually Stephen Moffat had broke the fourth wall there. 
Yeah, it is fourth wall breaking, though, because in fandom, tip, fans typically bond with a particular doctor, often the first one they watch, who kind of defines mm-hmm. what the role is for them. And so for a lot of American fans, at least before the revived series, their doctor was Tom Baker. Right. Right. And um, so Stephen Moffat uh, was growing up when Peter Davison was the doctor. And so for him, Peter Davison was my doctor. And so that line ends up in in David Tennant's mouth as a wink to the fans who were Mm -hmm. fans of Peter Davison's doctor. Mm hmm. Uh, I do like in this that uh, that the the the, fifth, the tenth doctor says the fifth is not every man who can pull off a decorative vegetable. Yeah, uh, referring to the <laughs> celery that he wears on his lapel. <laughs> um, the the fifth doctor calls the tenth doctor a skinny idiot ranting at him, which yeah. is a lot of fun, and then thinks he's a fan from Linda. If you remember, oh yes. Linda, right. the, the the London investigation in detective agency. And yeah, so, and from some of from us, Love and Monsters, and, Love and, and Monsters. some of us shuddered because of our are painful memories of that episode. I'm still not a fan of that episode. Which, it's really only the end of that episode that's bad. The rest yes. of it is actually quite good. I, I had a few general kind of comments about Time Crash. Um, I think this is uh, probably the greatest Doctor team-up story. Mm-hmm. Um, we've had multiple incarnations of the Doctor meeting a number of times. I think this one is arguably the best. It is certainly the most fun. Yeah, um, it's comparable as a as a as a, just a short video to Night of the Doctor, which really paid off Paul McGann's Doctor and was you know gripping, uh, and yep. it really shows between Time Crash, which is just played for comedy, and Night of the Doctor, it shows that you don't have to have a long story mm-hmm. to have a powerful and effective story. Uh, short stories can be powerful too. In fact, you know. One of the most famous uh, short pieces of flash fiction ever is just six words, and it's not the not the ones you would say to dethrone a British prime minister, but uh, the the short story "Baby Shoes" is only six words long, and it's incredibly powerful. If you don't know it, uh, it's for sale. Baby shoes never worn. Mm. Ooh, and, yeah, it's right yeah. In the feels. it really <laughs> hits you. And it's just six. It's flash fiction. It's just six words long. And it it shows how powerful short form fiction can be. And I think uh, Time Crash and Night of the Doctor are examples of that in the universe. And they definitely show the real talent of the writer because it takes a lot more talent. You know, I learned this when I was studying homiletics. It takes a lot more talent to to express a point concisely and clearly as you can. Anybody can ramble mm-hmm. on for 30, 40 minutes and, you know, talk about many, many things, but to keep it short and concise and, you know, to, to write a short 10, 5, 10, 15 minute uh, short episode like this and to do it yeah. well shows a lot of talent. Who said, I'm sorry I went on so long. I didn't have time to make it shorter. There's a, that's a, a famous yeah. quote. I don't remember. I've heard that, it. but I don't know who said it. <laughs> yeah. I didn't have a time, time to write you a short letter, so I wrote you a long one. That's right. That's right. One other thing I I thought I'd mention since we're kind of tying up the Martha era is, you know, we get to see a bit of Martha leaving where she's now she has self-actualized. She's gotten over the doctor. And it occurred to me that the annoyance that a lot of people had, including us on the panel in rewatching the Martha series, because we saw it stretched out. I mean, we did like a Martha Mm -hmm. episode every other week for Mm -hmm. Uh, months. And so we got to see her relationship play out with her pining over the doctor for a very long period of time, subjectively. Mm -hmm. But in the era of binge watching, if you sat down and watched all of all of the Martha season, bang, bang, bang in a in a day or two, it occurs to me that her relationship with the doctor and her pining over the doctor wouldn't be nearly as as bad as it was if you're watching it stretched out. Right. I've heard some fans say that they, in retrospect, when they went back, re, you know, anytime recently to watch this season again, mm-hmm. the Martha comes off a lot better than they remember. Uh, mm-hmm. So, and, 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 it, and it, in fact, I, I agree with that. Yeah. You know, and it, it is interesting because by binge watching it, you're almost watching it real time in a way. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, you, you think about it, the whole season occurred within a couple of days, basically, even accounting traveling through time and all that. 
you know, maybe yeah. a week or more. Yeah, you know, it don't... wasn't this long, drawn out, you know, three months or whatever it was when it first aired and however long it's taken us to get through the episodes, you know, but it was, you know, fairly short time frame. Yeah, those episodes each feed directly into each other. So there's not like long periods of time we're not seeing. That's true. That's true. Uh, one thing that, that was, uh, stuck out with me was uh, that when Tennant tells Davison the master's back, you know, yeah. five asks if yeah. he still has the beard and ten says, no, well, he has a wife, which I just thought was a very interesting <laughs> construction. Yeah, uh, well, because a beard is often used as a a, a, a euphemism for something uh, like a, a, a relationship that hides uh, some other aspect well, of the person. Specifically, um, in in you know, it's it's used for a woman who is married to a man who is gay who is pretending to be straight and the wife is then the beard that proves his manhood right right that's mm. it, that's especially I, i've seen it used in other ways like a spy has a has a beard which is a a a relationship that hides that he's really a, a spy but yeah like a cover identity but yeah today that's pretty much what it means so yeah. interesting i think that's the original meaning of it in this oh, okay, usage okay. One thing I got a kick out of where the where of course uh, Peter Davison definitely does not look like he did when he was the doctor, right? Um, yeah, and so they we, explained it due to you know like time fluctuations or something like that. You know because the two <laughs> TARDIS has crashed together, it caused him to look prematurely old. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's a bit of hand waving just to cover the obvious fact the actor hasn't the, played the, the part in a long time, and the humor yeah. of you know him taking his cheeks and then you get a little chubby there too, and you know. Mm. <laughs> What's what's really now so this you know episode has not much of a plot. Um, it's right. basically a chance to just see these two doctors interacting. And one of the things that's always fun about seeing the doctor interacting with himself is the sniping between different mm-hmm. incarnations of the doctor that they he doesn't get along with himself. And we get to see you know so like when when Patrick Troughton first shows up in John Pertwee's TARDIS in the Three Doctors, oh, you've redecorated. I don't like it. And <laughs> yes. and so, you know, what this episode really delivers is clever dialogue. And that's right. really what the joy of this episode is about. So we get lots of bits of clever dialogue with the the two doctors playing off of each other. They both use the incredulous, what? You know, on each <laughs> yeah. other. Um, we've got the reference to the frowny face. Ooh, I remember that one. Um, <laughs> not a lot of men can carry off a decorative vegetable. Uh, I, I, I really like the, the kind of early 2000s computer reference where, um, Peter Davison is looking around the TARDIS and says, you've changed the desktop theme. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um and then Peter uh then uh David Tennant pokes fun at Peter Davison whipping out the brainy specs. He's got eyeglasses he wears that he reveals you don't even need. You just wear them because they make you look smart. And then <laughs> he reveals he does exactly the same thing. Yep. Right. Um, right. I also really like um the uh you know so they've got a time paradox because the TARDIS has crashed into itself. And um, they explain that <clears throat> they explain that uh, if they don't defuse the paradox, that it's going to blow a hole in this in the universe that's exactly the size of Belgium. And and, <laughs> oh, then, yes. and then later, Davison gets the line urgently: two minutes to Belgium." <laughs> such a great line, right? And the time paradox that the the only reason he knows the solution. It's because he was there to see the solution the first time. So right. we have this this paradox, yes. Yeah, that's, uh, a bo- that's what's known as a bootstrap paradox, where something doesn't actually get created. It just loops on itself. And this is an information bootstrap paradox. Right. And then it ends with uh, he for- him forgetting to put the shields up again, because uh, that, that's how this whole thing started. He forgot to put the TARDIS shields up. And that's when he gets hit by the Titanic. And that's what then brings us to... And so that was November uh, that when this aired. That brings us then to the Christmas special about a month, a, a little more than a month later, where it's aired. This aired on December twenty fifth, two thousand seven. But the setting, as as far as we understand, is there's still a year. The doc, like the Doctor's timeline, is a year ahead of our timeline. So mm-hmm. it's technically it's still December two thousand eight. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure when that ever gets fixed, or if, even if it does. I don't think it does. Yeah, yeah, I think he's always a year in the future of us. 
So, uh, so he, so that's the beginning of Voyage of the Damned. Couple of quick notes on uh, Time Crash before we move on. Oh, um, sure. They, I like the way they point out, they kind of compare and contrast the two Doctor's eras. So, um, Doctor Number Ten like whips out a sonic screwdriver and says, "Oh, wait, you went hands on." Which was true in Peter Davison's era. They got rid of the sonic screwdriver because they thought it was too much of a plot convenience. Right. Um, so he Which didn't use it. And what a shock is. it was! <laughs> well, now it they you know they use it as here's That's a way to worse. move the plot forward since we only have forty five minute stories. Um, right. Also, we have uh, David Tennant saying, "Ooh, the the squeaky voice thing when I shout. I got that from you." <laughs> and 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 trainers. The the both of these doctors wore tennis shoes. Yes. Um, and so we get some nice compare and contrast. Uh, I love how when they first meet, Peter Davison, of course, doesn't realize who he's talking to. And we <laughs> have this drawn out recognition where David Tennant obviously remembers his past self. And so we have this drawn out recognition. And then when he thinks Peter Davison has finally figured out who he is. Peter Davison veers off in another direction and says, oh, no, you're a fan. <laughs> and he, and he, thinks yeah. he's, he thinks he's a fan who snuck into the TARDIS. And that's when he mentions the Linda group and says, I can't have you people knowing where I live, um, <laughs> <laughs> which is a feeling a lot of celebrities have had. Well, the funny parts about that is that really was never talked about in Classic Who. Mm -hmm. The Doctor was always unknown until he shows up and solves the problem. Mm -hmm. Right. He wasn't a celebrity. Yeah. Um, my favorite variant on that failed Time Lord recognition thing is actually in the recent Big Finish release of the um, of the one of the most recent collections of the Diary of River Song, which is entirely devoted to River meeting various versions of the master. And mm -hmm. she initially in the first story in the set meets Missy. And we and even though River, we learn late, later learn, knows exactly who Missy is, she plays it as if she doesn't. And she keeps repeatedly guessing the wrong Time Lord. Um, <laughs> so she like runs through the Ronnie and the monk and stuff like that before she finally, I know you're the master. My favorite version of that is uh, was Husbands of River Song. When she didn't recognize Capaldi's doctor. Yeah. Hello, that was, sweetie. That, <laughs> yes, yep. that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> I like at the end of this where the, the, the doctors have solved the problem and, and they're returning to their respective timelines. And uh, David Tennant has kind of like bonded with his past self and they've just cooperated to solve this Belgium problem. And he goes to do a high five with himself and it fails. Because he yeah. Does, yeah. Peter Davison doesn't return the high five. Yes, yeah, so uh, what's a high five? Then, yeah, but <laughs> yeah. then as as Peter Davison is fading out, you know they both thank each other for having helped uh, solve the problem, and Peter Davison replies, "I'm very welcome." <laughs> yeah. yes. Very very clever. So and then that as that ends, we 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 turn to Poseidon Adventure of uh, Poseidon Adventure in space. Yeah, isn't it? So I, I, a few. Uh, Outside the story notes, before we get started, this episode was the highest charting episode in Doctor Who history for a period of time. Wow. This Voyage of the Damned. This, and it was the uh, second most watched program in the entirety of 2007, which is wow. pretty amazing. That uh, is. So, so um, now Journey's End would re displace it as the number one Doctor Who episode ever. Uh, in, in was it seven months later? But mm. uh, but this was very a very popular episode at the time, and I think probably partly because of Kylie Minogue. The and she oh, yes. is uh, co-starring it. She is a um, in real life, she's an Australian actress and singer. Uh, people of a certain age probably know so <laughs> have heard of her. Well, she's she's not as well known at least here in the states. Uh, yeah, she had basically uh, a minor hit with the remake of Locomotion, the song Locomotion. Right. But that's as far as I can recall, that's the only real hit that she had here in the United States. Although she was much more successful both in Australia and uh, the UK than yep. she was here. This is yeah. kind of a persistent thing on Doctor Who where they do stunt casting with people I've never heard of. 
Um, <laughs> you know, this, the same thing was with with um, uh, with introducing uh, the Donna character. I had never heard of the actress. You know, the comedian. Well, yeah. as, as you said before, Jimmy, it's a small island. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you know. everybody's there. Well, the funny thing is, is they will as the little wibbly wobbly tummy wimey stuff. The Christmas episode we talked about this past Christmas in, in to, at the end of 2018, from our point of view, uh, which was the 11th Doctor's Christmas Carol episode, also featured an actress who was known for being a singer in yes. real life. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting how they, they, they've kind of gone to this well twice. Uh, but and in there's... this one, uh, we have uh, uh, Kylie Minogue playing Astrid Peth, a waitress. And now, we again, I kind of mentioned, so the Titanic plows into the side of the TARDIS and comes actually through the wall. Then the doctor backs it out and the TARDIS heals itself. And it's not literally the Titanic, the original Titanic. It is the space Titanic, a cruise liner from another planet. That's the been planet made to look Stowe. Stowe, it, yes. Take, uh, take the, uh, you know, the Earth Titanic and strap the warp nacelles from a Star, Star, Star Trek starship and you've got this yeah. Titanic. Yeah. That's it's what it looks Argo. like. <laughs> it's the Argo from... Uh, Oh, what was that? The, the Japanese, the anime show. Uh, oh, st- uh, space. Oh, I forget it is now. But there's a sh- Star Blazers. Anime- Star Blazers. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's the Argo. Uh, basically, a space uh, ship. Uh, ship, literally mm-hmm. seagoing ship. So anyway, the thing that kind of I. So are these humans running the ship? It Ooh, looked, they looked human, right? <laughs> they they look human, but I think it's I think they're meant to be aliens. They're just like time okay. lords. They just look human, even though they're not. Yep. Okay. Par- parallel development. On yeah. okay. Because we you know we have had the doctor run into humans, but in it, the future out in space, right. As right. opposed to this. Okay. So, uh, I think Doctor Who has all, has often sort of waved its hand at it, rather than Star Trek, where we just put bumps on their forehead. They just kind of wave their hands that they look like humans. Parallel development. They are aliens. Uh, so let's yeah. go with that. And then, so we have the doctors, uh, you know, materializes on board this Titanic like vessel. Everybody's dressed in period clothing and it's Christmas and it's, it's a cruise uh, to Earth at Christmas time to celebrate Earth Christmas uh, here. And, and, and so, and there are angel robots as servants who you know are going to go bad. Because it's a Russell the, T. Davies Christmas episode. Yep. Right. What is with Russell T. Davies and robots at Christmas? <laughs> like, what yeah. is, like, why does he keep going back he to must, that He well? must have not got, like, you know, Rock'em Sock'em robot set when he, for Christmas one year or something. I know. I mean, like, what is, yeah, it was always like these, <laughs> and these bizarre angels. So uh, we have uh, Astrid per- Peth, Peth, not Perth. Uh, I know. I kept wanting to say Perth, too, but it is Peth. Yeah. Especially given that she's Australian. And so. She uh, is a classic dreamer. She she was a, a down on her luck a girl from back home who took a job as a waitress on this ship so she could at least fly out into the stars, even if she doesn't get to go on any planets. And, you know, she wants to see the universe. Essentially, she's the prototypical companion material. Right? Yeah. She is being set up to be the perfect companion for the doctor who recently has lost a companion. Right. And that's that's what and we're being set up for. By the end of the episode, he will ask her to be his companion and she will agree and then she will die. And and not yes, yep. and not just companion, like there's a whole romantic element that that yeah. pops up here, which is exactly. like if I'm Martha Jones, I'd be ticked. <laughs> like, I'd be yeah, with exactly. you for all, all this time and suddenly, oh, you know, you run into Kylie Minogue you and got, you want to God of her Rose her. and all of a sudden you find this yeah, waitress. <laughs> so uh so and then he also runs into this um Lower class couple who don't quite fit in with mm-hmm. all the the, hoi, the hoity-toity rich rich people uh, who won their way. Yes, her Mar- Morvin and Foon, which I I kind of like. They're just they're such fun, nice people. Which you're supposed to get to like them because you're going to lose them. And yeah. they won their way onto this ship through a lottery, and they befriend the doctor. He befriends them by you know s- sort of by by sitting with them and showing up the rich people who are making fun of them. Uh, the, the robot angels are of course malfunctioning and, uh, the doctor and Astrid, uh, sneaks Astrid onto a shore leave through the, with these teleport devices where the, uh, they have this, uh, professor of earthonomics, they call yeah. it. He's supposed to be, you know, an expert in everything about earth, but gets everything wrong. Like everything is yeah. just yeah. slightly twisted. 
And uh, yeah, so it's, the you know, England old... is ruled by good King Wenceslas. Uh, people worship a god named Santa who has terrible claws and his wife, Mary. Um, and <laughs> yes. they go to war with uh, with Turkey and eat the Turks. Yep. <laughs> like savages. Yeah. Um, now, and then, now and Mr. Mr. Copper, the uh, the he's the earthenomics guy. Yeah. Earthenomics yeah. might look familiar to some people if you've ever watched the. Uh, Great British uh, comedy, uh, Keeping Up Appearances. Oh, he was right. Richard Bucket. Oh, B- Richard Bouquet. Richard Bouquet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If and you haven't watched a- that, it is so funny because yeah. he, he's he's just kind of a he plays a down to earth kind of middle class older guy, and his wife thinks she's royalty or wants to be royalty. Yeah, and oh, funny. it is absolutely hilarious. And then there's another character, this little uh, red, spiky-headed guy named Bonacavallata. Mm-hmm. Uh, I love the some... fact that he will not let the doctor shorten his name. That's awesome. <laughs> yes. It's like, no, you're yes. going to say Bonacavallata. Yeah. Can yep. I call you Bana? No, Bonacavallata. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so he's he's worried that he's not gonna, he's not going to fit in, but they 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 beam down to the planet and it's deserted. Everything's deserted, and the doctor's like, why? Like he's, he's expected the shopping district to be full of people. Well, it turns out. After the last two Christmases where aliens have invaded, people have gotten out of London yep. for the holidays because, you know, as we might does. get attacked again. Yes, as one probably should. Uh, but they run into Wilfred Wilf. Lott. Yeah. Well, Intro my, Wilf. One of my, my oh, favorite except, characters. Except we didn't know who he was yet. He no. actually, the initial intention wasn't that he, this actor, Bernard Cribbins, was going to come back. Right, he was just going to be the guy, a guy that they encounter as as a, a newspaper salesman. Um, who, but he he just he does so with such a little part. He does so well, you know, with yep. the queen and he salutes her and the whole thing. I mean, yeah, he does such a great yeah. job. Uh, this is this is also not his first time on Doctor Who. You may remember nope. him if you ever saw yep. the uh, the two Peter Cushing Doctor Who movies from the sixties. He's in the second one. He plays a companion who's a police officer. That's right. That's Which, right. if if you haven't seen them, you can go to uh, Amazon Prime. At least you used to be able to. I think they're probably still out there, and you can watch the Rift Tracks version of it. Oh, yeah, that would be good. It was a lot of fun. A lot of fun. And then we and so and then we turn go back to the ship, and we we turns out that the captain of the Titanic is sabotaging her. He's going to yeah. crash the ship. He He's, relieves all the, the the officers from the the bridge. He's also Uncle Jimmy from the Fall and Rise of Reginald Perrin, <laughs> <laughs> because. There's only like ten actors in all of the UK. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking so, of small island. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it, and one guy, a young guy, um, midshipman Frame, will not yep. leave the bridge because it's against regulations. You have to have two watch officers at all time, apparently. Right. Even though that's not how it really works, you only need one watch officer. Right. Um, but and and when it becomes obvious that the captain is sabotaging the ship. He like pulls a gun on midshipman frame and he's talking about how he agreed to this betrayal and they're humanizing him a little bit. And he's saying, I was told there would be no young men, that it was all going to be, you know, old salts who had seen their time. And so he's disheartened at the fact he's got this midshipman here and I'm going, hello, (laughs) he's a midshipman. He's supposed to be young. Um, yeah, right. You know, if you knew the ship had midshipmen on it, you would know they would be young because class. I mean, for those who are not aware, midshipmen are like the lowest ranked officers in in a navy. They're in training. In they're training, yeah. yeah, yeah. Middies historically in the 19th century, they would the between the 19th and the mid 20th century, the average age for a midshipman rose from 12 to mm-hmm. 18. Yeah. yeah. So if that's the average, you're dealing with a lot of kids here. Yeah. Right. Because in right. the in the United States Navy, the term midshipman is used for the uh, students at the Naval Academy. Right. So and they're the, the officers to yeah. be, if you will. Yeah. yeah. So maybe he just he he didn't expect it to be a midshipman assigned to the ship or, or something like that too. Which, but yeah. yeah. But he should have he should have known. Um. So the. Uh, the captain is sabotaging the ship, and there and the doctor's shore leave is cut short uh, with Astrid, even though she's enchanted by the the rather blasé <laughs> trip to uh, Main Street or High Street in the in Britain. Uh, and uh, it's and, a shopping district. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. And and then uh, so the ship is crashing, and the doctor promises he will save Astrid. I promise he will be saved. Mm. Oh, the doctor with his promises. Yeah. And so how the captain is currently sabotaging things is he, by the way, this is a Max Capricorn cruise ship. And yes, we learned that this cruise line is kind of down on its luck, but they have Max mm -hmm. Capricorn who always smiles and he's got a golden tooth that gl glistens in the commercials. Right. Um, and what the captain is doing right now, and you can kind of put two and two together. This is some kind of Max Capricorn plan since the cruise line is down on its luck. Right. Um, the captain has turned off the shields that should deflect incoming meteoroids, which uh, are now zooming towards the ship and are going to smash into it, uh, causing the crisis. But meteoroids don't leave trails in space. <laughs> and these things clearly are leaving trails in space. It's like, guys, there's a difference between a meteoroid and a comet. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, they it, it, like they weren't going through the atmosphere. <laughs> it looked like something from like, you know, spearheads from space or something like that. You know, classic who where the, you know, the asteroids are flying through and leaving a big trail behind them. Yeah. There was a whole lot in this episode where you had to suspend disbelief more than more than even usual for for a modern Doctor Who. Uh I, I have to say, you know, overall, I, I enjoy this story. I like this episode, but there was a lot of, I uh, had to like avert yeah. your eyes if you were into <laughs> accuracy and reality. Exactly. It's really the characters that are what's yes. interesting in this story. And, exactly. Oh, and, and at this point now, the angels have become part of the plot because we've seen right. them malfunctioning up to now, but they haven't become actively involved. Um, and now they start killing with their halos with their halos they pull them off and they they're attached to their heads by these two rods that come up from their heads it's not just a halo on one rod it's two yeah. rods mm -hmm. so when they take off the halo to use as a discus or shuriken to throw into people and kill them they now have the two rods sticking up it looks like horns right and it's a very effective angel to demon visual suggestion transformation <laughs> right. um also, they proceed, they're normally used for giving information. So when you ask them a question, they'll say, information, the current temperature is 78 degrees or whatever. Um, and now it's information, you are all going to die. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and the, 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 the crisis is that the engines have, are failing. And because, it's, because the asteroids of uh, yeah, or meteors have hit the ship. They've and now so been the struck is... by an iceberg. I mean, meteoroids. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And the, 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 the TARDIS has been ejected into space, uh, and the ship is going to crash. So we have TARDIS separation, and the mm -hmm. ship is going to crash into the Earth, and the nuclear storm drives are going to explode and burn the entire atmosphere, and everybody on Earth is going to die because we do not have small stakes in modern Who. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and, and not, well, not just is the TARDIS separated by floating around in space, but it, it has locked onto the largest gravity mass, namely the Earth, uh, and has decided London. to land itself. <laughs> yes. Uh, it, it likes London and it's going to London of all the earth. Uh, they have to so now they have to journey through the derelict ship to get to the bridge, which is like I had said before, just like the classic movie and the modern remake, The Poseidon Adventure, which uh, I remember watching as a small child who uh, woke up in the middle of the night and sat down with my parents to watch late night TV. Oh boy! <laughs> and yeah. watched Shirley MacLaine fall to her death <laughs> in an upside down ship. One uh, of her the, many deaths. One of her many deaths. Yeah. That was a... <laughs> Maybe that's where yeah, she got right. the idea that she was reborn. Reincarnated. Reincarnated. Yes. So we, uh, we have the... In addition to uh, the overweight couple, the lower class couple, and Bana Kafalata and Mr. Copper and Astrid, we also have the rich guy who's a jerk. Uh, that's yeah. just... Yes. I'm not even sure he had a name. <laughs> Rickson Slade. Oh, that's is right. That name. is a rich jerk's name anyway. So yeah. <laughs> probably why I forgot I, it. I also like how all the people on the ship, whenever they will say ladies and gentlemen, they'll always add ladies and gentlemen and Banacafalata. Yeah. So, <laughs> do not want to exclude them. <laughs> doesn't fit into either one of those classes. Right. And now there's, a, there's this thing about Banacafalata that comes up where he's part cyborg which he's ashamed of because the society looks down on people that are cyborg, but Astrid says it's okay. New laws give them rights, like even being able to get married. And I'm thinking... Yeah, we know what this is a cipher for in England in 2007. Yeah. Especially so, since coming from Russell T. Davies. So, yeah. yeah. Right. But it also be, it is important for the resolution, which when we find out that Max Capricorn is himself uh, a cyborg. Uh, yeah. 
later I also, on. I also like when she tells Bonacafalata that the new laws will like let him get married. He looks at her and says, "Marry you." <laughs> and, and then she tells the doctor, "I think I just got engaged." <laughs> <laughs> right now, that's that's a Bonacafalata has got uh, some confidence. Uh, yep. So that was he's, he's so, a cool little character. I really like him. Uh, yes, yes, and heroic. He gives his life for everyone. But uh, yep. as before, we get to that. The host, the, the which is what they call the angels, uh, these defective robot angels, are killing everyone who has survived the the initial crash, which it wasn't many. Most of the people apparently died very early, quickly in this. Um, then we have this uh, moment where Astrid asks the doctor what Christmas is, and he says it's a long story, and he should know because he was there. Yeah. So apparently the doctor was in Bethlehem uh, for the birth of Christ, which is nice. Uh, that would be a very interesting big finish production. Yeah, <laughs> or, that, that, or, that would we'd have to tread carefully there. No, we would. As I say, interesting. I don't know. I didn't say good. I said interesting. The, they <laughs> they have um, done things. I mean, they they have re, you know religion related ones in big finish, but they've taken on some surprisingly interesting ones. There's a fifth Doctor adventure that Big Finish has done called the Council of Nicaea. Where they're huh. at the Council of Nicaea, the first one that defined the divinity wow. of Christ. Wow. And one of the companions at the time is an Egyptian fa female pharaoh named Aramem, who's not really historical, but she's traveling with the doctor, and she's used to being worshipped as a living god. And I haven't finished listening to this uh, set, but it'll be interesting to hear how Aramem re reacts to the Council of Nicaea. That is got to go on our list of future discussions uh, yeah, for, absolutely. for this. That's definitely, we have to do that. So Astrid asks the doctor how he knows Earth so well, since he, he kind of tells Mr. Carver that he's got it all so wrong, and he admits that he learned his earthonomics from correspondence a, school. A diploma mill, yeah. <laughs> and the doctor says, and dry I cleaner. Was so, yeah, and dry <laughs> oh, cleaner. By, by the way, with the doctor being at the original Christmas, he also says, I got the last room. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yep. He's the reason they were in the stable. And so, uh, but the doctor says, uh, I was sort of, a few years ago, I was sort of made, well, sort of homeless, and er, there was Earth. Uh, a reference to the fact that the third Doctor was stranded on Earth by the uh, Time Lords mm -hmm. uh, as punishment and by the BBC's low budget. And then, uh, and then we have the, them, have, as, as you always do in any sort of derelict ship sort of moment, you, they have to cross a chasm across a tiny bridge. You know, there's yeah. this death-defying yep. crossing. And poor Morvan falls to his death into the engine in sort of a tragic, senseless way even. You know, not even trying to cross yet. He was just in, standing in the wrong place, and it gave way under him. So yeah. Morvin dies. Then Bonacafalata saves everyone by shooting an EMP to just to, to ele electromagnetic pulse the the uh, flying the angels who'd come flying down to attack them. Um, and then Foon sacrifices and, and, herself, and he and he therefore dies because he, he's right. he he no longer has power to run himself, and right. there's not time to get him to a safe place to recharge. Right. And then Foon, who's grieving the loss of her husband Morvin, she then sacrifices herself to take down the the last angel that was threatening them, uh, and to to crash down into the uh, the engines below. And yeah. so very quickly, we've lost three the three people the doctors pledged to save very quickly right here. So mm -hmm. that's uh, it was really amazing how quickly the, that happens. There's an interesting bit right before this where, and this is a modern who trope, but. Um, Rickson Slade asks the doctor, well, who put you in charge? And mm -hmm. the doctor gives a typically for this era of who self-aggrandizing speech, yeah. right. where it's like, I'm a time lord from the planet Gallifrey in the constellation of Casturbarus. And OK, you do know that constellations are only seen from the outside. You wouldn't ever <laughs> identify your planet by what constellation it's in. Right. Um, but uh, but then, even though he said he's a time lord from Gallifrey, Astrid later is telling him he needs to eat and says, you might be a time king from Ganaby, but you still have to eat. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A little <laughs> deflating there. Yeah. That was really good. So the doctor finds, has this re realization that there's something going on weird on deck 31. And so he sends the rest of the group to go to the bridge, to continue on to the bridge, while he's going to go find out what's being hidden away on deck 31. And that's where the doctor meets the the disembodied head of Max Capricorn in a sort of Futurama sort of moment here, uh, which has been placed yeah. on top of this uh, sort of forklifty rover. cyborg uh, rover body. Yeah. Mecha suit. So, yeah. So the, the, the so here we have, you know, the, the, the monomaniacal evil guy reveals his plan. He's a cyborg in a society that hates them. His business has failed. 
the board has voted him out, so he's going to destroy the company by crashing the ship into Earth. He'll survive on board uh, in this safe room, and then he's got plans to for his men to come pick him up and whisk him away to another to a planet where he will live off his yeah. his life in retirement uh, in secrecy, where the women like cyborgs. Um, like yes. But the the fact that the nuclear storm drive is going to kill everyone on Earth is going to ruin the company. The scandal will just be too huge. And so the board right. that voted him out is all going to end up as paupers back on planet Stowe, or, which is an yeah. interesting twist. I assumed initially I assumed this was going to be some kind of insurance scam. Right. Um, but it's not an insurance scam. It's a straightforward revenge plot. Yeah, and and then the doctor is almost undone uh, by Max Capricorn, except here comes Astrid uh, against orders, can flying flying in on a forklift, and sacrifices herself to save the doctor and Earth. I mean, we have Astrid mm -hmm. to thank for for that uh, saving us, and mm -hmm. uh, not the doctor primarily. Although later on he he gets to to do his bit in saving Earth, and uh, and so as the doctor is so angry now that he's lost Astrid, who he'd asked recently asked to become his companion uh, and he strides in slow motion away from the death and destruction and fireballs behind him in that <laughs> tr oh, super cliched action sequence and then yep. he ascends with the angels to the bridge yeah of the so ship. In, the, in the previous <laughs> episode last of the time lords we had the doctor as the resurrection of jesus now we have the doctor as the ascension of jesus mm -hmm. <laughs> it was i mean a little much. It's, uh, let's just say a that. little that was on a, the nose. Oh, yeah, a little too much. Uh, then uh, we get to the bridge and we have that great moment where the doctor realizes that midshipman frames first name as Alonzo. So he gets to say, Alonzi, Alonzo. And, uh, and so that that gets into yeah, canon. That's one of two things that he says he's always wanted to say. The first one is when he's trying to get to Section 31 and he runs into angels and they're going to kill him. And he's he's realized if he says, I forget exactly what it is, but it's like override protocol number one. And he gets to ask right. three questions yes. and he blows two of them by the second time he does this. He blows two of them. He says information protocol one or override protocol one, whatever it is. That gives me three questions. Am I correct? Yes. And then he realizes he's blown one of them. Can I start again? No. <laughs> he's blown a second one. <laughs> and, and he then reasons with them using his third question, says, well, I'm not either on the passenger list or the crew list, so I must be a stowaway. Therefore, uh, I am to be arrested and taken to the nearest authority figure who's in Section 31. Uh, and, and so they agree to that. And he says, I've always wanted to say this. Take me to your leader. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then uh, when and he meets Max Capricorn, Max smiles and his tooth does gleam and the doctor yep. says it really does that <laughs> really yeah that was a good line but i got a kick when he uh when he the first time he used the security protocol trick there on that bridge that little catwalk and he starts throwing out numbers and he throws out 666 and 42 yes among others yes, yeah those are the two of the ones he throws out uh so when he gets to the bridge he's trying to uh to, trying to get the ship to you know pull out of its dive and he's not sure whether he can so he orders the evacuation of Buckingham Palace, and we see the queen run out of the, the building in her slippers and robe. With but her like, corgis. Yeah, where yep. is she going? I mean, if the ship crashes, it's not Buckingham Palace that's getting destroyed. It's the entire planet. Yeah, how about that? Yeah, um, so, I do yeah. like the fact he, like, calls her on the phone. And, I mean, yes. he gets on the phone and says, get me Buckingham Palace. Right. Um, it may be that they've done something to the drive at this point because they've been fiddling with the drive and there may yeah. be a line in there where they've explained how they've removed its planet destroying capacity or maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. Well, he was hoping and what he did was is he, he used the the friction of the atmosphere to restart the drive or some some yeah. wavy, hand waving yeah, thing, yeah. Yep. Uh, technology explanation and pulls up just in time. Kind of, yeah. kind of like, you know, people who had old manual transmission cars where you could roll it downhill and pop the clutch. That's yeah, basically yeah. what he did. It's a, roll, <laughs> he it's a rolling start. Yeah. He, yep. he pops also, the clutch on the nuclear storm drive. <laughs> also, we get some follow-up for Wilfred Mott where we see him out in front of his newsstand shaking his fist at the sky saying, Don't you dare, aliens. Don't you dare. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Again, Wilfred is the best. And, uh, and so after they've saved Earth and saved the ship, uh, the doctor realizes that Astrid, at, when she died, was wearing a teleport bracelet. And in fact, that's how she got down to Deck 31, was teleported. And he knows that it has an emergency, of course, an emergency setting 
known as the plot device that saves yeah. a copy of a person if they have an accident. Uh, but th- it turns out the system's too damaged and it's just a ghost of Astrid that I- he sends her molecules out the window to travel the stars and so on and so forth. Shades of silence in the library slash forest of the dead. <laughs> yes, a little <laughs> bit of that. Uh, then he helps Mr. Copper is about to be uh, arrested because he's he falsified his, his credentials to get his job uh, as the earthonomics expert. And so the doctor helps him escape from the ship before the uh, authorities show up. And Mr. also, Mr. Yep. S- Mr. Slade, the the uh, evil businessman, has had substantial redemption by this point. He's still a rich businessman, but he's been humanized by all the experiences they've had. And so, like he and Mr. Copper hug at the end, even though they're totally different social classes. Although he does uh, make out like a bandit because he shorted uh, his yeah. stock. <laughs> well, yeah. and Capricorn, and that leads to a really good line. Now, at this point. I mean, even though he does say, hey, by the way, I made a ton of money on this. Um, yeah. That's the only kind of jerky thing he does up, yeah, at, uh, the up other, at the end. Yeah. Other than that, he's actually been really redeemed. But the fact he does that, by the way, I made a lot of money on this because I sold all of my all of my Max Capricorn stock. Um, it leads to a line where Mr. Copper says to the doctor, not exactly the kind of person you'd choose to survive if you could choose. And then he says, but of course, if you could choose, that would make you a monster. Mm. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. That, that's actually a, of all of this story, it's the one that really evokes a, a, that, that moral question of, the, of what the doctor does, that the idea that the doctor saves everyone regardless of whether they deserve it or not. It's a little bit of a Christ image there. It's it's not so much that it's not mess, this messianic imagery so much as it evokes this idea that that uh, mercy is given not uh, f- on the basis of the person deserving it as opposed as, as much as that's a thing that we do because it's who we are. Uh, so yeah, that is a that is a nice moment. Uh, so he helps Mister Copper escape to Earth, and Mister Copper is like, uh, "Well, what am I going to do now? I I barely know." <laughs> what anything is going on down here, and I don't have any resources. He says, oh, you still get that credit card. And Mr. Carver had this credit card for, for the shore leave that people could use to mm-hmm. buy gifts with uh, in Earth currency. Yeah. And he says, oh, it doesn't have much on it. It's just a petty cash. Oh, like a million pounds. <laughs> is that is that yeah. very much? Yeah, he tells him one million pounds is 50 million credits, and he realizes, yeah. wow, I could, I, you know, I I've made got like money. a bandit here too. Yeah. Yes. Now, interestingly, earlier in the episode, because um, Morvan and Froon had won their tickets, uh, yeah. and and they reveal the only reason they won them is because Froon had like called or Froon had called a call in line five thousand times, and <laughs> right. each each one was a credit. So they ended up actually paying five thousand credits for their tickets in the form of a phone bill. And Morvin says it's going to take us 20 years to pay that off, and we may as well have just bought the ticket. So we know you can buy two tickets for 5,000 credits, and we know that a million pounds is 50 million credits. So I did the math, and yeah. it turns out a, <laughs> a first-class ticket, which would be 2,500 credits, um, is only 50 pounds, or in modern American dollars, given the current exchange rate, $63.64. So Ooh. that's a really cheap first class ticket. If you can get well, a first yeah, class is. space liner ticket for sixty four bucks, well, it's cheap for us. The economics <laughs> is that maybe their ec- economy is so much like less hyperinflated than ours. Perhaps maybe we're hi- hyperinflated. I don't know. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so a million yeah. pounds would it would seem to go a long way then uh, for for someone uh, of of uh, from that uh, world. So, uh, so Mr. Copper, who has always been a traveling salesman, apparently, can now have a proper house and a garden with a door, as he says. And chairs. And, and kitchen yep. and chairs and windows and plates. And so uh, the doctor, and, and by the way, it's snowing again. And once again, it's snowing with the doctor on Christmas. And once again, it's not actual snow. It's, it's never actually snowing. It's usually some remnant or residue related to the event that the doctor mm-hmm. just averted. Like again, Russell T. Davies keeps going back to the same tropes, the same thing, elements from his Christmas specials. Like, like n- never a new thing. Anyway, it, it really does underscore why it was a good idea for them to 
downplay the Christmas stuff in these because they'd really burn through all the ideas. Yep. And once they right. did the once they did the Matt Smith a Christmas Carol, it's like there's nowhere to go but down if you're trying mm-hmm. to really make this Christmassy. From here on out, if you're doing a Christmas episode, it just needs to happen at Christmas like Die Hard does, but otherwise not really have anything to do with Christmas. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. the line the witch in the wardrobe one, which we will eventually get to, Ew. was really a a probably the low point for these Christmas yeah. season specials and then we uh we we merry christmas sister copper and we fade to black and we get this nice uh message on the screen at the end and memory memory of verity lambert obe yep. 1935 to 2007 and as uh doctor who fans will recall verity lambert was the first producer of the very first uh part of doctor who yeah 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 she died something like a month before the show had aired right right she died in yeah. 2007 so uh god rest her soul and so mm-hmm. that and so that was there was a, so what do you think of this episode? I mean, in, or in, any other notes you might have I, uh, my my take on it. I like I said, I enjoyed it. I liked Astrid. I would have liked to have seen Astrid as a companion. I, we, mm-hmm. And apparently we can't mm-hmm. even have big finish uh, uh, adventures with Astrid because she's dead. Oh, <laughs> but, sure. You can. You can just re- <laughs> reintegrate those atoms somewhere else and have Astrid. That's adventures. Exactly. It's like well, a there was, there no was totally actually dead. rumors that she was going to return, that they were going to do something like that, where somehow she was going to make an appearance. But other than kind of a quick flash in, in a, you know, like a flashback scene. Right. That was it. That's right. Yeah, it would be interesting. But I mean, I loved I loved that we had we got Donna Noble. I really enjoyed that season. But uh, I oh, yeah. did like Astrid, and it was, I thought it would be could have been an interesting. I do understand that having another romantic interest probably would have been not as yeah. good. Yeah. So going the friend route with Donna was really the way to go after Rose and Martha. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. I, I thought it was interesting because so this is one where. Um, Lots of people die. Not everybody. It's not the horror of Fang Rock, but lots of people die yes. who we've invested mm-hmm. in. The only survivors of the group are Mr. Copper, the Earth Anomics guy, and the rich businessman. And um the midshipman. And the, rich, and the midshipman, yeah. Um yes. but he's not one of the people the doctor's really actively working alongside. Yep. He's always just up on the bridge. But uh, and the rich businessman who survives is, you know, it's it's deliberate irony that he survives, because when you meet him, he's so unsympathetic. You say this guy's going to be the first to die. And they deliberately subvert that expectation. And given that they've killed off the romantic interest and obvious companion um, by the end of the episode, how do you get a happy ending out of that? And they (laughs) and they do it in an in 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 kind of in stages they the first thing they do is they partially bring Astrid back so that with the teleport thing so that they can release her into the universe and 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 the doctor says you're not falling which she was afraid of it's you're flying and so then they let her float off into the universe and that's partially takes the sting out of her death that she's now in some way exploring the universe like she always wanted to um, and then we have the Mr. Copper thing where he mm-hmm. gets this new life on earth. He, he gets out from under his problems. He's, he's actually going to be rich on earth to the extent a million pounds now actually is rich. Um, and, <laughs> and cause I don't care how many credits it is, you know, England's expensive. Um, yeah. but, <laughs> but I guess he doesn't have that long to live from what he says. So it's, it doesn't have to last him that many years. Um, but then at the end, he hugs the doctor and there's actually a bittersweet thing. You know, they're standing there among the, in the fake snow that's residue from the ship. And he, copper kind of alludes to maybe traveling with the doctor and the doctor says, I travel alone. It's best that way, which is, you know, poignant given that he just offered the companion role to Astrid. Yep. Um, but then they do have a hug, which is the happy ending and, and, you know, it's kind of like the Wrath of Khan. You have this tragic event that happens at the climax, but then you find ways of progressively lightening the mood after that. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, Father Corey, do you have any uh, last uh, notes? No, nope. no last thoughts. So, so I do have uh, some feedback from listeners on our episode uh, 126, Last of the Time Lords. Uh, Kelly Brown on Facebook says, uh, the, she says, this was a good episode 
But I agree that the doctor as the Messiah stuff at the end was a bit annoying. As a Catholic, I did wonder if someone committed mortal sin during the year that never was, would they have to go to confession for it if the for if they were one of the few that remember that year? So, like, if Martha or one of her family had committed a mortal sin during the year that never was, did it count? Did they have to go to confession? It, as Kelly says, it technically didn't happen, but you remember that it did. I know uh, that both of you are dying to answer that. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> the classic, you know, time loop did, you know, yeah. Um, did it happen? So, you know, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been either a year and a week or a week, depending on which time zone you're reading, you're doing this <laughs> in. And I, during the year that you don't remember and that I remember, but I never actually did, I mm, try to figure <laughs> that one out. Jimmy, what do you say? So this is something that... um I think we've talked about a little bit on Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World in the multiverse episode, um, but it's yes. going to the answer is going to depend on how your theory of time travel works. If you say that um, history is unalterable, which is not the Doctor Who version, then you can't undo this, um, mm -hmm. and so that points us towards the branching timeline theory. And if it's a branching timeline then the version of you that was extinguished when time reset would have had that mortal sin on its soul um, unless it was repented of. But when the new timeline branches off from an earlier point a year sooner, this new timeline version of you never commits that sin and thus right. never needs to confess it. So you'd effectively be twinning the person one twin had the mortal sin and got extinguished when the timeline was extinguished. Um, the other never had the sin and thus doesn't need to repent of it. There's also a third possibility, which is something you see in fiction but really isn't taken seriously by scientists, although I've thought maybe there's a way to make it work scientifically, where essentially you have a continuity of identity between resets of the time loop somehow on some deeper level. And if that's the case, then you would have committed the mortal sin in the year that never happened, but you now can't remember it, and thus um, you are not subjectively going to be held accountable for not mm -hmm. confessing it. But if you do remember it, then you would you... need to confess it. Yeah. Like if so, you're Martha Jones's family, you remember I committed this sin, you right. have not been reset, you need to go to confession. Right. So anybody that's been reset doesn't need to go to confession for their mortal sins they commit that year. But those who remember that year and may have committed a mortal sin need to confess anything that happened during that year. So, yeah. so Jimmy, would you, you would argue then that um, it'd be like any, any mortal sin that, you know, we are obligated to confess any mortal sin we remember, whether we've gone through a time loop or not. Yeah. You know, if we've yes. committed a mortal sin, we need to confess it. I mean, and if you don't remember that mortal sin, obviously you need to confess it if you remember it. But if you don't, it's not like, well, you didn't confess it because you don't remember you did it. Yeah. Right. And Amy Pond totally killed that eye patch lady and River Song's rationalization that it was in an extinguished timeline doesn't count for anything. Amy remembers <laughs> it. She needs to go to confession. Yep. That's right. That's right. <laughs> the theology of Doctor Who. That's very good. The sacramental theology of Doctor Who. Excellent. I just don't want to be the priest to have to hear that confession. <laughs> well, you'd be the ideal priest to hear that confession, Father Corey. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you are a time traveler, Wait a go second. to Father so Corey. This, this happened nine months from now, but we won't actually get there. But you did commit the sin. And wait, what? <laughs> As a Doctor Who fan priest, you are the ideal yes, uh, confessor yes. for all Doctor Who uh, time travelers. Uh, then Amy Flowers, our friend, she has a. Uh, she says, "I 100 percent agree with Jimmy about Martha's healthy sense of self and her decision to leave the Doctor." It shows how strong she is when she realizes that this man is amazing and can show her all sorts of wonders, but that doesn't really matter because she's not getting what she needs from him, so it's time to leave. Mm -hmm. I love that about her, and I wish she got more respect in the fandom rather than commonly being seen as the rebound companion. Uh, then she says, to address your thoughts on what happens with her and Tom, in the Sontaran stratagem, Donna immediately picks up on the engagement ring that Martha is wearing, and Martha reveals she's engaged to Tom. I'm not sure what happens between that and the end of time where she's married to Mickey. And and she does re recall that we do see Captain Jack again in the season four finale uh, where Donna keeps hitting on him. So <laughs> which I do recall. <laughs> so. Uh, so, yes, uh, Martha's sense, healthy sense of self. She does sort of redeem herself from mooning uh, over the doctor throughout this season. 
in sort of reco- recovering that sense of she needs to stand on her own because she's not getting what she needs from the doctor. All right. Well, thank you both for that feedback. And we love to get feedback. Uh, before we close things out, I want to uh, thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the Secrets of Doctor Who, including Nick R., Jamie N., Denny H., Michael L., and Gene R. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the Secrets of Doctor Who and all the shows we do at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So that's it from us. What did you think of this 2007 Christmas special, Voyage of the Damned? You can send us your feedback, just like Amy and Kelly did. Go to sqpn.com or the Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page and leave us feedback there, or send an email to Who at sqpn.com. And we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the second Doctor story, The Underwater Menace. Woohoo! <laughs> Until then, Father Cory Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Doctor Who. Glad to be here, and thank you, Dom. And Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Doctor Who on StarQuest, and remember, information, you're all going to die. Right.